Hello, sisters. I'm going to explore with you as women who know what it's like to be marginalized, to be thought of as lesser beings, how we, as women, can use the actually enormous power we have to influence society's treatment of others who also want freedom from disrespect and domination. Sexism, the belief in the superiority of men, and speciesism, the belief in the superiority of humans, are actually just one thing. It's all supremacism. So if we're against one form of supremacism, we can only be against them all. For as the feminist Connie Salamone said, it's hard to talk about how people mistreat you as a woman if your mouth is full of the bones of a small tortured bird. And no woman can dare really speak of rights when wearing the skin of a slaughtered cow on her feet. We must be consistent in opposing all discrimination and all oppression. No doubt you've seen pictures of suffragists, those brave women who fought to win the vote. When they were imprisoned and went on a fast, refusing to eat, many of them were force-fed as geese are today. When brave women chained themselves to the iron railings outside the British Parliament, men gathered to mock them, shouting at them to know their place brazenly telling the press that women haven't the brains to vote. Of course, at that time, men honestly believed that they were vastly superior to women. Men had such stupid ideas about women that women weren't allowed into medical school because men thought they might faint at the sight of blood. Just think about that for a moment. Today, there are more women doctors graduating than male ones, but at the time, Lord Littleton's advice to a lady was, be plain in dress, sober in your diet, in short, my dearie, kiss me and be quiet. Women were considered stupid bird brains. Bird brains? Take pigeons. They learn by observation, their exemplary parents, they mate for life, they have extraordinary eyesight, and they can navigate by low-frequency radio waves. Recently, a study showed that pigeons trained to look for cancer from images do so with as much accuracy as a human medical technician. I was lucky to be born after the suffragettes, but in the 60s, I marched in Washington for a woman's right to equal pay and to stop being the person who any man in any office could call upon to stop whatever she was doing to bring him coffee. Later, I became one of the first female deputy sheriffs in America. And the male deputies were grumpy about it at first. But if they were being sent out on a drug bust where the dealer had big guard dogs, which many do, those men who lifted weights and were gun experts learned that I could handle dogs. So they'd say, we're not going unless she's going. They would grab their bulletproof vests and I would grab some dog leads and off we'd go together to bust the bad guys. Deciding that women aren't as important as men is obviously wrong. We can insist on our rights, but other living beings can't do that because their voices aren't heard even when they scream. And just as men proclaimed women are dumb, even people who should know better often dismiss animals as dumb. But if you've ever seen a cow operate a water pump with her horns, just from watching how humans work that pump with their hands, open a gate with her tongue, or you've heard an elephant trumpet a warning to her calf, you know they are intelligent and they do have thoughts and they do have language. It's just that humans are too ignorant and arrogant to recognize that. In our very first biology classes, we were taught that we are animals, flesh and blood, emotional, pain and joy experiencing animals. 
That's why, as the women's rights pioneer Gloria Steinem said, we must treat them as if we are not ranked, but linked, because together we are sisters under the skin. Historically, women have been told by our fathers, our brothers, our boyfriends, our husbands, what our place is and how to behave. In the book, Woman and Nature, the author compares passages from older books in which women are patronized. Here's one from a book on etiquette. Girls should be subjected to restraint. It's necessary to accustom them early to the suppression of their caprices so that they may more readily submit to the will of men later in life. And for comparison, the author includes a passage from a recent horse riding manual. The rider should insist that the horse stand still until told to move. Fidgeting on the spot or moving without a command must not be tolerated. Isn't it the same idea? In the 1400s, when the explorer Christopher Columbus sailed from Spain to the Americas, he thought he had discovered India. So he called the native South American peoples Indians. In the accounts of his journey, you'll read of how Columbus abducted a local woman and gave her as a gift to a Spanish boat captain, just as someone might give a kitten to someone today. When she resisted his sexual assaults, the captain thrashed her. He raped her repeatedly and then, tiring of her, he traded her on to others, eventually having outlived her usefulness when she became ill she was consigned to the sea. In other words, she was thrown overboard. In the very same way today, sheep being exported to the Middle East are thrown overboard when they become ill. Their panic, their suffering has to be the same as that woman's. And just as that woman was seen as a commodity, so other animals are seen that way today. Women who see the injustice here must fight that damning bias. Andrea Fernandez is an Aboriginal Australian writer. She says she's ashamed that it took her so long to understand that all living beings should have rights. But, she says, fortunately, not as long as it took Australia to recognize Aboriginal people as actual human beings. Aboriginal children like her weren't allowed to play with white children, and they were denied a proper education because of what she calls the toxic belief that something as arbitrary as the way you look should either afford you privilege or allow you to be segregated, shunned, even murdered in cold blood. Born different than the ruling class, vulnerable others, including animals, are victims of prejudice only because they are different in some arbitrary way, their gender, the color of their skin, and so on, when in all the ways that matter, we are the same. To discriminate on the basis of skin color is as illogical as discriminating on the base of gender or species. It's as illogical as saying that only living beings who are covered with only skin, not fur or feathers or scales, should be allowed to be caged, chained, and we should be allowed to kill them because their skin is covered. The root of the problem of women's subjugation is that we are often defined by our sexuality. We are viewed as baby incubators, carriers of men's seed, not as equals, but as vessels. That's true for other females too. More than 20 billion of our hen sisters are imprisoned on factory farms every year, only considered valuable because they make eggs. When they stop producing, they're slaughtered. During their hideously miserable lives, most of them are kept in cages so small that they can't even raise one wing or take one step during their entire lifetimes. You see them in cages, beside the road, in the heat and the dust, being dragged out by a wing, sometimes breaking that wing, 
so that their throats can be slit and someone can make butter chicken from their flesh. On today's dairy factory farms, females are tied by the head in filthy stalls in their own waist. And did you know that they're all raped? Yes, they don't breed naturally these days. A man sticks his hand up inside her and inserts a syringe of sperm into her vagina. Every decent person denounces sexual abuse of women, but many don't know about, or they blithely accept, the sexual abuse of other females who happen not to be human, but are also subjected to sexual violation. And it's awful for them just as it would be for us. And of course, all mothers love their babies. Yet, being commodities, animal mothers are usually not allowed to keep their children. I have a picture of a marmoset, a little monkey, who was kept in a laboratory as a baby-making machine. One day, researchers came to take her son away. She knew she'd never see him again because every time she gave birth, the researchers took her child away. This time, she fought hard to protect him, but she was no match for the men. She was mortally injured trying to stop the kidnapping, and she died. What a beautiful mother, and what an indictment of the human animal. With cows, the milk the mother cow produces for her own calf baby is stolen from her to make curd and sweets. If the calf's a girl, she will be used as a milk machine, just as her mother was. Mother cows try in vain to follow the carts or the wheelbarrows taking their babies away. They cry out for someone to hear their pleas, but they're kicked and they're hit. And did you know that male calves in India are often starved to death and that some of them are stuffed with straw and propped up beside their mothers so that their good mothers keep valiantly trying to produce milk for them? For centuries, men dismissed women's language as babble and thought they should be silent, that talk, real talk, was only for men. But all living beings communicate. Rhinos use breath language, cows and horses use subtle facial expressions to communicate. Frogs in the city have figured out how to use drain pipes to amplify their calls over all the human din and city birds get up early so they can call to each other before the rush hour noise. Some fish use luminescence or light language to send messages to each other in the darkest recesses of the ocean. Dolphins whistle and they give their babies whistle names. They can recognize the whistle of a companion they last saw 20 years ago. In sharp contrast, when I went to my Cody Canal school reunion, although everyone said, oh, you haven't changed a bit. You could see us sneaking a peek at each other's name tags because no one had a clue who they were talking to. Animal oppression is convenient. Just as sexism can exist as long as no one challenges men, so speciesism will continue as long as it too is unchallenged. So just as we object to misanthropy, we must object to misothery. What can women do? It's up to us to tell people how clever animals are and to show our empathy. Women still control most of the kitchens in the world, and kitchens are places where plans can be laid for dietary domination. Women control not only what we eat, but also what our families eat. We can influence what's being served at work and in school, pack our children's lunches with the right things, choose veg restaurants and vegan catering for gatherings and business meetings, bring vegan dishes to colleagues and friends and neighbors, and so spare animals from servitude and slaughter with every single bite. Women also make more buying decisions than men do. So we possess the power of the purse. Because of us, Nike has a new shoe made of recycled ash. Due to our requests, vegan wool 
is on the market and due to our complaints, hundreds of retailers have agreed not to stock cashmere or leather or angora. The writer Andrea Dworkin, who was beaten by her husband, pushes women to speak out, never to allow anyone to be treated as an object. She wrote, the wicked and the complacent read acceptance into a woman's silence. So please don't be silent. Politely protest if you see anything stolen from an animal sold anywhere, because that's what makes change happen. Good luck in all you do, and please know that Peter is a resource to help you with your advocacy for animals. What is speciesism? Speciesism is discrimination against another individual because they're not of the same species as you. It's just another ism like ageism, sexism, racism. It's a wrong way to think because we're all in this together. So speciesism is something to object to. It's a form of supremacism. What does respect for animals mean? Respecting animals is really the same as respecting a woman, a child, uh, anybody. It means you don't impose your ideas upon them. You treat them considerately. You respect their perspective. You look at what they would want. You put yourself in their place and you don't treat them as if they were things or others, but as other individuals like you who have interests. What are the practical implications of really taking the interests of animals into consideration? One of the considerations that we need to afford animals is that they have emotions as we do. They hurt. If you burn them with a cigarette, they're in pain. Uh, if you kiss them, they're happy if they like you. Um, that they're, they're just like us. And so we need to be sure that we're not exploiting them, that we're not seeing them as food on the hoof or as something to wear, never as something anyway, never as entertainment for us, never as there for us. They're their own individuals, their own people. And so we have to be sure not to exploit them for their sex, for their gender, not to take their eggs and their milk, not to take their very skin and wool off their back, we have to look at them as agents for our consideration. Motherhood is not exclusive to mankind. All mothers deserve safe motherhood. Can you share your view on this? Well, yes. I mean, motherhood is motherhood, isn't it? And there's a wonderful video by an Australian mother who is holding her newborn baby and saying that her baby is the most precious thing in the world to her. And it's the same when you see cows running after the farmer who has taken away their baby. Um, all mothers love their infants. And that monkey I spoke about in the lab loved her son so much that she died for him. You can see a little mouse or a rat going through the sewer, carrying her baby in her mouth, trying to get him to safety. Mothers are mothers. It doesn't really matter what form they come in. Some of the best moms in the world are found in the animal kingdom. Can you share your experience? Well, I think the internet is full of animals who are sharing their experiences as mothers. Um, you can see a bird who is trying to get a predator away from the nest by pretending to have a broken wing and risking her life to preserve the young in her nest. There's a wonderful video on the internet of a bear standing in front of traffic stopping it while her infants go back and forth. And they're very naughty. So they're not going in one direction and getting to the other side of the road. She has to keep going back and lugging another cub across the road. And it takes her time. And one of those vehicles could have sped up and hurt her, but she knew her job was to be a good mother and put her life, her being, in front of that traffic. I, it, the internet's full of these wonderful examples, and I urge everyone to watch them. Giving physical or emotional pain to someone is not acceptable. It's time to realize our habits, which include violence. In your opinion, what are the most common habits that we as humans have, consciously or unconsciously, that support violence? Someone once said, no matter how far removed the slaughterhouse if we eat animals and wear animals, we are complicit. So it shouldn't be out of sight, out of mind. 
We're intelligent beings. We're empathetic beings. And so we have to keep in the forefront of our minds what they are going through. They're in the factory farms now, tied by the head. They're in the laboratories, strapped down to the tables. They're on the export ships. There are leather tanneries all over India where their skins are being filled with toxic chemicals so they can be made into purses and shoes and belts. We need to be aware and we need to make sure that we are not seeing them as objects for us to use, but as others like ourselves who deserve our protection or at least deserve to be left in peace. The core concept of the animal industry involves exploiting motherhood. If we respect motherhood and mothers, should we stay away from all animal products and services? If we believe in preserving the environment, um, yes, we have to stop throwing litter. If we believe that we shouldn't beat people up, then we shouldn't punch them. If we believe in animal rights, then we cannot use animals for anything. They don't belong to us. It's that simple. Peter's motto is, animals are not ours. To use for entertainment, to use in experimentation, to eat, to wear, or for any other reason. It's a very simple rule. And when you go shopping, you just ask yourself, or you're entertaining yourself, ask yourself, is there an animal in this mix? And if so, do you think they wanted to be there? Are they volunteers? And if the answer is no, then don't buy it, don't use it, don't do it. Can saving animals help women who didn't have children to express their motherhood? You know, one of the good things about women is that they are unashamed nurturers. I feel sorry for men. They have to try to be macho half the time, whereas we know that it's all right to show that we care. We recognize the worth of being mothers and nurturers. And so the more expressions of that, the better, whether it's for orphans, the impoverished, or animals who need our protection. Let's really trade on that value. How can we use our feminine energy to build a non-violent world? Well, women are great influencers and we rule the marketplace. So I think everything that we say and we do and how we raise our children and our grandchildren and how we relate to others shows that we understand exploitation. We understand being disrespected and we won't stand for it for ourselves or anyone else. What advice can you give to our participants? I would say don't be like the fly on the chariot who sees the wheels going round and says, oh, look at what a lovely dust I raise. Actually raise some dust. You don't want to be on your deathbed looking back and think, oh, I could have done something, I could have said something, and yet I didn't. Go out with a smile on your face because you said and you did what was true to yourself. Be the kind person, the kind of person that you believe yourself to be. We are powerful women.